Okay, let me present uh, good afternoon on behalf of the board of directors of the HEADS Consortium. I would like to welcome you to our 2022 Best Practice Showcase, celebrating technology innovation for Hispanic success in higher education. My name is Ilmari Santiago, and I will be introducing the speakers for the breakout sessions of this room. Before we begin, we request your support with the following. Please change your mobile phone to silent mode to have your full attention and avoid interruptions. This session is being recorded and please, if you enter on um, virtually, please remain muted. This presentation will be in English. We have closed captioning available. We will have time for questions at the end of the presentation. And finally, we invite you to see the QR code that the staff will share to all participants to complete the electronic evaluation form for this session before you leave the room. For the virtual participants, the links to the evaluation will be available in the chat. I'll make sure to post them a few times in the chat at the end of the session. Please make sure that you select the time and date for this session. Your feedback and recommendations are very important to HETS. Now we're ready to start. The title of this presentation is Supporting Hispanic Student Success and Ecology of Virtual Support Framework at HSI. Uh, our speaker, please welcome Dr. Floralba Arbelo from the Alviso University of Miami, Miami campus. This presenter will be virtual. Doctor, the floor is yours. Good afternoon, everyone, and, um, and welcome to the presentation. I appreciate you being here today. Um, I'm Dr. Arbello, and I serve as the uh, Dean of Student Affairs um, at the Albizu University Miami campus. I'm also an associate professor for the education programs, and, um, and I live actually in Dania Beach, which is a little north of Miami. And just to tell you a little bit about who I am, um, I, I've been married uh, 23 years. I have two teens. Um, I enjoy travel. As you can see, um, I visit Puerto Rico every year, except during the pandemic. Um, and we do a lot of fishing, as you can see. And for those of you who are on the island, um, these, this is right off of Desecheo, uh, which is in the Northwest area, right off the coast of the Northwest point of the island near Aguadilla. Um, I have friends um, that date back to high school uh, and um, we've been friends for decades and we've traveled to Puerto Rico together. Um, and I do a lot of humanitarian work. I've lived in Haiti and um, I've done research in Guatemala, the Dominican Republic, in Cuba. I have the best student affairs team on earth working with me in Miami. They're down here in the right hand corner. I enjoy um, working with students and um, listening to students and collaborating on behalf of students as well as with students. I've also had the honor of uh, being named the mace bearer, which is a really um, big deal in academia. And this is a picture here that was in 2018 for my research um, on Hispanic student success. And so um, just that's just a little bit about me. If you wanna connect with me, this is my email and my LinkedIn profile. Um, please connect with me. And if you wanna have conversations, chat, collaborate, I'm open to all of it. So um, I've been doing some research, oh, I'm sorry, Albiza University, right. Um, so our, our mission at Albiza University, we educate professionals in the behavioral sciences, speech pathology and other disciplines. We, um, we really are committed to research and improve the quality of life um, of the communities in which we're embedded. And our vision really is to be an international leader in academic innovation research, community service, promoting diversity to generate a transformative social impact. And we were founded by Dr. Carlos Albizu Miranda, who was a psychologist. And we've been around about 50, 50 plus years now. Um, and Dr. Albizu Miranda was, um, he was born and raised in Puerto Rico and studied at um, Purdue University. And his vision really was to educate culturally competent, culturally sensitive professionals to um, work in marginalized communities. I think he was really ahead of his time. 
So who are our students at Albizu University? Um, and this is for the Miami context, which is where I operate. And a lot of my research and findings have come from, from this environment here in South Florida. Um, our student profile has been post-traditional from its inception. And so uh, post-traditional really, these are commuter students who are employed, have families, and in many cases are living in multi-generational environments in their homes, right? They're taking care of parents, grandparents, and they have children. 80% um, of our students are Hispanic, um, mostly female, 50% are English language learners and first-generation students. Um, undergraduate students represent about 55 to 65 percent of the students that are between 18 and 29 years of age. So you have an idea, but we predominantly serve graduate students. We have a growing um, undergraduate population, but we began as a graduate school and grew backwards, if I might, you might say it that way. So we started with a master's program and then um, added another master's program, a doctoral program, and then grew um, a bachelor's degree program. We have about three of our programs fully online. The rest are hybrid and on campus. So, you know, you think about student success, right? And you think about these beautiful spaces that we have on our campuses, but a lot of that has been transitioned into this virtual support context. And, and all of you have experienced that um, in here in, in the States as well, right? In Puerto Rico and in the States, we've had to think, rethink how we serve students um, especially for schools like mine that weren't traditionally on, we weren't virtual, virtual school. We were uh, a college or university that had a few online programs. So making the switch to a virtual context was really important um, in terms of services and, and developing a framework for, um, for student success and helping students feel um, like they're still part of the university, even though they're remote. So many of us have, have been experiencing that in higher education. So um, social integration in virtual contexts, right? As you know, we're, we're predominantly serving Hispanic students and a lot of what we do is social, right? As Hispanics, we are social at work, we're social at home, we're social in our communities. It's a really important part of our culture and, and take thinking about that. Um, is really important when you're serving Hispanic students. Um, so I've worked on a qualitative study, a few studies I've done over the past few years that on the practices that support Hispanic student success in online learning contexts. And um, while it was mostly qualitative, um, I did follow up with a survey to almost 300 students. And so a lot of what you're finding here is feedback I've gotten from students I received over the years. Um, through different different projects that I've worked on. Um, and I really use off, so, Tinto's social integration theory to frame a lot of the work that I do, but I also include um, Bronfenbrenner's ecological systems theory, and that has a lot to do with the relationships that we have as individuals and how those relationships help us to develop. And it could be my relationship with a school, it could be my relationship with an institution, um, or my relationship with a mentor, a peer, an educator, a family member, and how these really all come together to, um, to, to, to help develop an individual, right? And we know that if you're serving um, students, right, they come with these experiences, these life experiences, these, in some cases, it's trauma, in some cases, they're positive experiences. Um, and a lot of that comes into play in, in how we interact, right, um, in an educational context. And so um, Tinto speaks a lot about how there are different phases of student, the student life cycle right, if I may, um, and looking at the student not only from the admissions perspective, from moving from admissions into the program perspective, and what takes place, you know, what, what is that lifespan like, um, what kind of support does a student need, what kind of onboarding, what kind of experiences, and how this takes place in virtual contexts is something that, you know, we've been thinking a lot about and, and practicing and piloting um, programs and, and um, sort of these, these um, structures that we've developed, structures in virtual contexts. 
um, and also practicing a lot of social presence. Um, how can I show up? How can I be present in, in my environment um, for my students in virtual context, not only as a faculty member, but as a dean, you know, aside from like a coffee with the dean, you know, what the social presence look like for a student, you know, that could be, that could look many, like many things. It could look like responding to an email, helping them solve a problem, um, making sure that if I have virtual office hours, I'm present in those virtual office hours, making sure that services are working and operating, that digital um, environments are up and running for students. So, you know, we have to think about this broadly um, and, and their access to support, access to consistent communication and different types of communication. So I want you to kind of keep that framework in mind as, as we move through, through this presentation. So in my research, I've, um, right, in the, the specifically the qualitative research, um, we code, right? We interview people and you code, you, you have these transcripts of these interviews that can last 30 minutes, 60 minutes. Um, and then you have these pages and pages of, of, of information in front of you. And you, you read through and you begin to identify these, these ideas that are coming through right when when students or participants are answering questions and the same goes for any kind of survey that you do with students um, where they're open-ended questions you want to read that and you want to see what are the common ideas that are coming through this th this content that i'm reading and so some of this in in a virtual context for students when they're talking about like what helps them to succeed um, it's links and Links that work, right? Resources that are accessible and not only accessible through PDF, but through different means, a word document, um, ID, uh, letting them know maybe if this doesn't uh, download in this version, you can, you can use, you can download it in that version. So having different types of versions of documents for students to download, making sure that you're compliant, um, even for ADA in, in a virtual context. Um, consistency, uh, instructions that are clear, and, and if anyone can follow those instructions that you're giving a student, right, that you've posted, um, step one, step two, step three, but go through that and make sure that those things, this is what they're telling us, telling us that, like, their courses should provide links and resources that operate and that are clear, um, the consistent course design across anything that they're looking at, that they know that they're going to expect the same exact thing, right? Because a student has expectations. And when, um, when they are, um, when they enter a classroom virtually, let's just say, or a space, um, what are they expecting to see? And do they know how to navigate that space? Um, they, they want to know what they should expect and how that's delivered. And that's that structure in a virtual context, right? And not only course design, but even portals, anything that you have available for students, a website, is it easy to navigate? Are the links working? Um, is there training available for students? The, these are things that really support their success. Um, students want quick feedback. They want access to virtual study groups. They want access to professors, especially. Um, I can't tell you how many times I've had coffee with the dean and one or two students show up. But if it's if a professor has um, a, a coffee with you know this faculty member, they're all going to show up. They want to talk to that faculty member. There's the content expert. They're the person that they want to be mentored by and learn from. Um, they want synchronous class meetings. And that's interesting because a few years ago, um, I, I did a study where students were more interested in hybrid environments and they still are very interested in hybrid environments. Um, they want it to be a little more independent, but what I have found is that's shifting. They do want live meetings with their faculty member. If they're not gonna be on campus, then they, they wanna be able to talk to someone the way we're in this meeting room right now talking, right? With one another um, and, and meeting and sharing ideas. They want to make sure that someone is is available to them, um, and and student life activities that um, you know if we can't meet in person, let's 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 do a brown bag and let's talk about some of the issues that we're encountering, you know, with with this or let's ideas I, brainstorming on how we might engage, and so they they want interactions, they want responses to problems, and they want synchronous activities. To excuse me, I'm so sorry. They want synchronous activities that um, that enhance 
the, uh, the online experience. Um, so they want social presence in virtual contexts, and they also want access to support mechanisms that improve their online experiences, um, tutorials, right? So this winter, uh, what we did while we were on break, I had a student tutor, a peer tutor, work on two-minute videos um, on APA, two-minute videos on um, article critiques, two minute videos on plagiarism. And so these two minute videos and content, right? Um, we, we've posted in a portal that we have for students that, that has workshops and um, all sorts of resources for them. It's like a one-stop shop, both student services and academic. And, and those work, students want timely, quick um, information sources that will help them accomplish an objective that they have, if it's an assignment, if it's a paper, um, if they need to study for a test, they just like we do, I want to go get right to the source, I want to look at something and I want to pull from it and apply it so that I can complete what I'm doing. So they want access to student support resources that are, you know, that they are viable and um, pertinent to their context um, and that are they're going to be able to use them and, and glean from that immediately and move on. And so the big themes that I found, right, were structure in virtual context, social presence in virtual context, and access to student support. So there were some virtual learning factors, right? Students um, that they're they're talking about, right? They're talking about so what 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 works and what doesn't work, and you know, you, as a as a student affairs dean, right? I have to think big picture, and I have to think you know, what's working, what's not working, who do I engage with? Um, and so it's like, a, you, I have to think of, of that lifespan of the student, right, in this, in this big picture framework and include, you know, the academics, the course designs, all services, you know, our, our, our documents, our forms digitized, do students have access to their transcripts? Is there a curriculum online they can look at? Is there a curriculum they can follow online? Um, staff and faculty training that's student-centric in virtual context, because that's very specific. You know, it's one thing to be student-centered on a campus. It's another thing to be student-centered uh, in, in a virtual context. Student engagement, what does that look like for a, a commuter population? Right, so maybe you have to have um, activities that really are um, targeted because our students have multiple obligations. So for example, uh, last semester we did something where we, um, we had digital um, headshots, right? We had students book, um, we took a room, made it a studio and we uh, had digital um, headshots for students who wanted them for their LinkedIn profiles, who wanted them, of they needed a professional headshot. And so we did that as a service to students where they, they were on site, they came, they made an appointment, everything was social distanced. Um, they took their pictures and they had it emailed to them immediately. They were even able to edit it on the spot. And we found that was um, very engaging, engaging for students, uh, very useful. And we had a really good response um, to that kind of event, right? Um, Student research, really supporting student research um, is, is important, giving them avenues um, just like HETS does, right? HETS has this, this showcase. So, so host a student showcase. See what are your students researching? Where are they publishing? Where are they presenting? Um, make it streamlined, put, a, put people together to, to really support that effort. Um, and clinical training, you know, make sure that that. If, if there's clinical training involved in any of your programs, make sure those documents are available. There's a portal that they can use where it's almost like, um, uh, I forget what it's called, lived something. And it's, it's a program where everything can be, it's almost like a digital portfolio where students can post everything and keep it in a file folder um, that's accessible and shareable with their um, clinical director. So just, factors that we have to think about when we're in these virtual environments uh, with our students. And so some of those success factors look like a balance between independent learning and engagement, right? Those synchronous sessions that um, are not just reading off um, from a book or but really engaging in question and answers and discussions that are meaningful to students when they're learning their content, um, making spaces available where they feel safe to, um, to learn, 
where they or they don't feel like they're going to be criticized, um, you know, uh, but no question is stupid, you know, that they're open, um, they're, there's a space where they can ask questions. Um, this hybrid learning preference. So what we've learned is that students don't always wanna be on campus for those campus-based experiences. They want the option to have a hybrid experience. So, and even if they're fully online, they wanna know that there's a campus that they can go to um, on a weekend and use a library, use a study room. Um, they want social presence and they want faculty communication, right? It's really important that over and over again, you know, if my faculty member gets back to me immediately, it's easier for me to, to continue on with, with a study with what I'm doing with my assignment. Um, they can know where they stand, you know. Um, so sometimes when they're online, they feel a little bit of insecurity. And, you know, having timely communication is in, it's really so important for them and accessible resources. So what is the psychology of virtual support? right, support, right, that we've developed. Um, and so I look at it in this way, you know, consistent course structure, rubrics, student information portals. So we, we didn't have student information portals prior to COVID-19. And so what we did was I worked with my technology team where we have a great ed tech team. We have a small team, but they're very powerful in terms of their knowledge and their willingness to work with you, right? Um, and teach you and give you access as an administrator to, to some of their um, to some of their outlets, so that uh, they're sharing their knowledge with us, and so we develop a, like a student success portal, and it's like a one stop shop in Blackboard. Their students can access anything from registration tutorials to their 1098s to uh, the tutoring schedule to pre recorded workshops and APA cheat sheets and um, financial aid um, access. We have a Title V Graduate Research Center um, that's dynamic and just does great work with um, research and students and their doctoral process or dissertations or theses and um, digital learning portals and digital schedulers. All of that is in this one place where students can access. And we track activity on there to see, you know, what, what students, are, what, what, what are they accessing the most, what's being most useful for them, um, accurate information on, on websites, links to resources inside the, uh, the learning management system. And so I'm going to talk about a digital um, faculty collaboration tool that we developed from a retention committee that we have, um, and we'll talk about that soon. Um, so, so you have the virtual structure is really important. The synchronous uh, the social presence is, is just as important, synchronous course sessions, faculty engagement, uh, live virtual club events, study groups, virtual town halls, virtual offices. So that this is how you increase the, the, your social presence, this, this constant engagement that you have with students so that they don't feel that um, they're all alone in this, this whole, you know, online. Um, Access to support services like we've been discussing, synchronous tutoring. We have um, Zoom, Zoom licenses for all of our tutors. We have a digital scheduler where you know, they can meet with their tutor. We do have some on campus, but what we have found is that our students prefer the virtual tutor tutoring sessions and, and accessible in evenings and weekends as well. Um, academic coaches. So we have um, student success coaches that we have. Um, they're not advisors. They're almost like someone who comes alongside the student and you know checks in with them, connects them to to people on campus that can help solve their whatever issues they're having, whatever problem, wherever their stopgap is. We want to get them unstuck so they can continue with their studies and complete their degrees. You know, meeting with service units. So we host these like meet with the registrar, meet with the finance, um, the finance director director and we hold those virtually and students come and ask questions and they um, have their questions answered, meet with financial aid. So we do a lot of that. Um, IT response to queries, we track those, we track incoming emails and how quickly we are um, answering and solving student problems, um, which is a really big deal because um, we, we want students to, we, you know, the idea is get them graduated, um, get them economically fit right? They can go out and get a job that that's a living wage for them that where they can be successful and contribute to society and feel empowered. And, and that's part of what we have to think about when we're doing the work that we do. 
um, communication, consistent messaging, events, uh, social media, message boards, weekly emails, text messages, WhatsApp. So we use different means of communication. We've learned our students, some of our students don't read emails, so we text them. So oh, we'll text them and lead them right to to that to the website where something's posted that they really need to read. Um, we we use uh, our student council as a form of communication, and that's been really successful because uh, students, their first line of defense most times is going to be student council, and um, they'll they'll email them, they'll WhatsApp them, they'll send them messages, and and those get communicated to me when it's when it's really important and and there's some kind of intervention that has to take place, and so we have to find different ways of of supporting our students through our communication as well. So, right, we have to cultivate and nurture supportive online learning experiences. So higher, you know, a lot of times, right, um, colleges and universities really are cultivating a, a sense of belonging and community among their student populations, because we know, right, this is a fact, it's, it's tied to student retention. But, but rethinking that in these virtual environments, right, it has caused us, me, to reassess behaviors that support col the college going population. And I think we all have to come to that point, um, whether it's you're an adjunct professor or you're a provost, right? Thinking, re reassessing that context, you know, I'm in a virtual environment, what, what's gonna work for students now? What have they said? What are they talking about? You know, listening to them and, and really kind of having your pulse, um, the pulse of the student population. So some quotes that, you know, um, came out of some of, some of our, our, uh, our, our research. Um, keywords describe online learning, right? Self-discipline, this is from students. Um, Self-motivation, independent learning, time management, flexibility, challenging for social interaction. And so like in response to this, we hold like these 15 minute, 20 minute um, time management workshops or um, organizing yourself to study workshops or a 20 minute how to write a research paper workshop, you know, how to organize your study time. And so we've been really responsive that way to students. Um, live virtual meetings are important. So 86 of, out of 300 that responded to a survey told us that face-to-face um, -face meetings are important in learning experiences. So those, you know, that, that Blackboard Collaborate, if that's what you're using or if it's Zoom or WebEx, it's important for students um, to, to be able to talk to someone on the other side if they're in this virtual environment. And then my success online, the um, visual content, feedback, email responses, clear communication, access to professor on campus, peer networks, live video chats, short focused recorded lectures. Um, and these were really important for students. These were like the, the main themes that emerged from students what 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 my success online depends on right thinking thinking about it like that this this content that we're putting out there and and what what our behavior looks like in a virtual environment so what's some practical advice i have for um anyone who's here now or watching this later on you know um develop digital collaboration tools so we have um a group that meets um, a retention committee made up of not only administrators and staff, but faculty as well. And we discuss, and we, we, we discuss data, right? We can look at retention numbers um, and talk about, you know, where are we weak? Where are we strong? What are we doing well? And where do we need to improve? But beyond that discussion are these action items that really need to come out of that, right? Because it can't just be a meeting to meet. Everybody has meetings, but what are we doing after the meeting? And ideas really emerge from this group that are helpful. One was a faculty collaboration tool where we used Smartsheet, right? It's, um, it's like this digital powerful um, application um, that it, it's on cloud-based and, um, to develop these referral forms. So a faculty member, is, if a student is struggling, can fill out that form electronically and it goes right to the coordinator of student success to connect with that student and connect them with a tutor. Or if they need mental health counseling, the same, we have the same, same idea, we have the same tool. 
um, but it's focused on coaching or counseling. So if a student is in crisis, they can self-refer. If a faculty member knows a student is in crisis, they can refer the student. And our mental health counselor, we have a clinical social worker, we'll reach out to them. And then we have student success coaches. Now we're moving beyond that. We'd like to outsource some of our mental health uh, because we've seen a dr dramatic increase, right, in, in mental health issues among our students. Um, so maybe that clinical social worker will will triage, right, and, and say, okay, well, this can be handled by us. If it's not, then we're going to connect them with a, a licensed clinical mental health counselor. And so we're working on that now. Um, digital appointment schedulers. So students can go and look at the tutor schedule and book themselves, book, book their appointment online, like directly. They don't need to email anyone. They don't need to call anyone. It can all be digital. Um, One-stop shop portals, like the one I described earlier, those are really helpful for students and they're not expensive to develop if you already have Blackboard, let's say, um, or Canvas, right? Uh, web, web update sites. So we developed something called Info Central where we update it weekly with events and students know they can go there. But, you know, we also have a virtual success center and a student success center where we post everything. And, you know, so we'll lead students there in different ways through text messages, emails, um, however, you know, um, digital onboarding activities. So all our orientation now takes place virtually and we have an in, like sort of like this admissions life cycle. So it's almost like the admissions uh, department working with my department very closely and we connect coaches with admission counselors. So students have a coach from the time that they're enrolled and they know that they have this person they can depend on to reach out to if they have a question um, that, that they need answered or they need advice about something. Those are some of the strategies that we have done that's worked for us in increasing our retention um, and helping our students um, be successful. Um, collab the collaborative groups, we have a retention committee. That might not be what you have. You might have something else. Um, but these are deep discussions, you know, use data, discuss best practices and what's working and follow through on action items. I like to have action items because I don't want to have a meeting just to have a meeting. I want to know that something is emerging from this meeting that's applicable, a tool that we can use. Um, interdisciplinary cross unit con conversations, right? I, I am not an island. I need everyone else on my campus to collaborate with. Um, they have information that I don't. I have information that they don't. And together, right, we can look at a student's like case management, right? You really need to look at things holistically. Um, ongoing feedback from students, really touch points, try to have those touch points, those conversations, those moments throughout the year where you can get feedback from students, um, aside from surveys, um, aside from, you know, have a focus group, you know, talk to um, a club, um, but get that feedback, right? Read those um, professor evaluations, read the tutor evaluations, the coaching evaluations. We, we, we like to know what's going on. Um, embed student-centric culture across the institution. I can't tell you how important this is, uh, right? We're, we're, we wanna be student-centric. It just can't be student affairs that's student-centered. This needs to be an onboarding process from human resources right across the academic departments, right across all the service units. Anyone that's working with a student, no, we're student centric. That's really an important factor. Um, you will go the extra mile. People I know on my campus go the extra mile for students because we understand you know, our population, we know who we're working with and we wanna help them be successful. Cross-train staff to think virtual context. You know, everything that we do, we think, how can this be accomplished virtually? You know, did you put the instructions out there? Follow the instructions yourself and, and for, for an action that has to be taken. All of that is really important. Um, collaborators are, um, I can't tell you how, how much I depend on other people to accomplish right objectives. Uh, we all need each other. And if we're going to be successful, um, you know, we have to build those bridges and, and that communication, that collaboration, it can't be selfish. And just letting you know, we're about our 10 minute mark for your presentation. So, however, you- We're done. I, I'm okay. done with my end. So we can have questions now. Okay, so any questions? I have a lot. 
<laughs> okay, so we have a lot of questions today. Okay, let great. Me, let me turn on the camera over here. Okay, ask your questions. Wonderful. Um, thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Yes, I can. Okay, wonderful. Um, thank you so much for a wonderful presentation. I'm, um, you know, I'm Dr. Mauricio Calabria from California, Cal State San Bernardino. I'm an instructional designer. I'm, I'm also um, a faculty in the information decision sciences department. So I think sort of like from an instructional design also as a faculty. And, um, and I just had a couple of things, you know, one is it's, I just wanted to start with a comment, uh, which is that I personally, I, I really love and enjoy seeing uh, the student success framework, you know, that, that you uh, place. I particularly enjoy your point in listening to the student and applying feedback. Um, something that I said this morning when I was in the panel presentation is that we have forgotten what student success is because we don't listen to students, right? We're looking at it from the perspective of what does the president want? What does the dean want? You know, what does the faculty? And we forget to ask the students, what does success, you know, um, mean to you? And how can we as an institution help you succeed? And then you touched on some of those. So I really appreciated that. A um, couple of my questions are, if it's possible, could you talk a little bit more, if anything, about the faculty? I know this was this presentation was about student success, and, and you touched on cross collaboration. You know, different campus IT departments, etc. Could you talk a little bit on, on about what was the faculty reception or willingness? To the work that goes into making this framework success or student success a success. This so, uh, yeah. So the you know the collaboration that I mentioned. Um, I'm trying to see if I can get back to it, but there was a slide where I talked about having. I have a retention committee, right? On that committee, we have faculty, and I can't tell you how important it is to have faculty as part of those conversations. The faculty collaboration tool came out of the faculty that came from them so when they see that their their advice is being heard um, taken and used successfully that's a big plus that's a win-win for everyone um, and we've gone from faculty referring students to students referring themselves and to students referring each other letting them know hey there's this tool you can use you can access this this way and you can so having faculty as part of that conversation, and they're also your messengers, because maybe there'll be a conversation somewhere that's like, well, the administration really doesn't under understand us, or you know, student affairs always wants us to be super flexible with our students when they're in crisis, and and then they can speak to that firsthand because they're part of those conversations that those faculty members. So we have faculty in that committee from every program. And that's, I can't tell you how important that is um, to just make them part of the process. And, and when they're part of the process and helping to solve these bigger problems that we have, um, they feel included, right? We talk so much about equity and inclusion um, and we focus that mostly on students, I think, but I think it's everyone on campus that we have to think about. For example, we just created a meditation room. Um, it was a big, it was a suggestion. We created a meditation room and it's on our campus and it's, you can go pray, you can go, it's for anxiety. You know, if you're feeling anxious, you need, and it's, it's a beautiful little space. Um, faculty use it, academic program directors use it, students use it. Um, it's inclusive, right? We want to be inclusive. We want to make sure that we're all part of that conversation. Um, and I had, um, faculty give me advice about it. And I have students give me advice about it, what they'd like to see in there. Just oh, make, <laughs> not make, make them part of that conversation. Yes, thank you. And, and that's a, a perfect um, segue to my second question, um, which is if you could, you know, you talked about equity <laughs> and equitable access to, to things, et cetera, and not just for students, but faculty as well, staff. Um, could you talk a little bit about um, student access to technology um, with regards to touching on some strategies maybe that you implemented to minimize the digital divide? And by that, I mean um, just a little bit of context for us as a public institution, we thought um, if we just give all students a laptop, it's gonna be fine, but it's more than just having a laptop. 
it had to do with, well, do they have a reliable connection to use that laptop? Do they have an actual, um, a place? You know, some of the students have to leave their home environment <clears throat> to be, you know, uh, conducive to learning. And so they were finding places to go or in the car or the parking lot. And so we realized that a problem was not just simply given technology, but how do you help, you know, minimize that digital device that exists both on the student's end and on the faculty, do you have anything to say on that? Yeah, so um, we had the same issue, right? We, we gave laptops, we gave hotspots. We were identifying students who needed support. But what we did, um, I, I, we have these brief videos on how do you use Blackboard. We held live workshops on how do you learn online? Um, how do you find spaces? We open spaces on campus. For student, if you don't have a study space at home and you can make it to campus, come to campus. We have study spaces here where you can sit for a few hours and you reserve that space and you can you can learn from there. And so I think being flexible, you know, I don't know if you know Felix Matos, Dr. Matos, um, from, he's the chancellor of CUNY. They took a pause. They took a two week pause when the pandemic occurred um, to allow students to catch up, right? Mm -hmm. They knew students are in crisis. Um, students need laptops, students need hotspots. And so everything stopped for two weeks, their entire schedule, so that everyone was going to be ready together. And so it's finding ways, right, to be ready together, whether it looks like uh, uh, an online learning workshop, whether it looks like having, um, we at every beginning of the semester, our ed tech team, has live 15 minute sessions for students who don't know how to use Blackboard. And they'll have 20 sessions in a week. They dedicate that first week to make sure our students are connected and students can call in, they can log in and they can, okay, this is what you do. This is how you access your course. This is where you go to see your syllabus. This is where the course guide is. This is where you submit um, your discussion or your assignments and, and having those types of, those touch points, right? Um, to connect students with resources. I think that's that's really a key in, in really making it an equitable environment. So it's, you're right, it's not just about giving the laptop, it's so what do you do with it? And do you have connectivity? And come to campus then. I have a student sitting in one of my offices because she needs structure. So she's here every day from 10 to three working on, she because she's, the online doesn't work for her. So come to campus and work from campus and we're gonna support you. Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, thank you so much. Um, checking on the chat. I still have two other questions if you still have some time. Yeah, sure. we're still good on time. We have until 12.55. So we have a, a little over 10 minutes more for questions. So I'll make, thank you so much for indulging me in this. Um, the, the next one has to do with, um, so we went from pre-pandemic to pandemic, and now we're sort of thinking that we are in post-pandemic, but in reality, I think we still are during the pandemic. And one of the problems that occurs sometimes in institutions when we implement um, sort of like urgent uh, rapid deployment of things is that we do it only as emergency, hoping that one day things will quote unquote normalize thinking when the pandemic is over, we'll all be back to campus, we'll all do things the way. And my, my, my question has to do with, what do you think or, or what are you and your institution doing and planning to continue to do once, you know, quote unquote, things normalize? Meaning, what do you think is very effective that is working now that regardless when you go back face to face and we're post pandemic, that you can continue to do so that you don't fall back you know, habits, you know, of pre-pandemic. So our students, for example, a perfect example is that is like the tutoring center. Tutoring was always physically here, always on campus. And when we took it online, we, um, we, we digitized. I have a dashboard. I can tell you how many sessions happen in a week, you know, who was booked, who wasn't booked, what are the topics. That continues. We're not really post-pandemic yet, right? We think we are, but we're not. So I think being flexible and listening, again, going back to students. So students that don't really want to come back 100% yet unless they absolutely have to, and it's an accredited program that requires it. 
Um, students don't want to come back necessarily 100% to tutoring on campus. They want us to keep that virtual option. So I think we have about 80% of our schedule is online, but we have we have an on campus presence as well. And so it's it's creating that flexibility where you can where licensing and accreditation standards allow you to because at the end of the day we exist right with this this really big knowledge base institutions that's who we are right we 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 have content but we exist for our students right yes. we we we're here to serve them and to make sure that there's there's um upward mobility there's economic mobility that they have degrees in their hands that they can go out and get gainful employment and I think we have to keep that at the front and center of all the conversations that we have um, with our students, with our peers, and with our communities um, to be very effective. So flexibility, I think, is the key and listening. Yes, thank you so much. I think there is a question on, on, on chat by Holly. Yeah, Holly has a question over here. We've experienced that as well in regards to the preference of online tutoring, the shifts to an online mode has also been so helpful for our students enrolled in full fully online degree programs whereas the whereas the service wasn't available for them before the pandemic holly if you want to ask your question you can turn on your mic or you can type it out whichever sure so that comment was more to echo the importance of, of that service that we've seen as well um thank you so much for your presentation first of all it's been really really compelling um, and very interesting for me personally, because our um, department at Southeast Missouri State University actually did some research on student experience last year as well. Um, although they were students who were enrolled in fully online degree programs before and during the pandemic. So if you want to attend my presentation tomorrow morning, I'd love to hear your feedback. But something oh, that sure. our students said um, was really a, a game changer for them were these synchronous opportunities to meet. And so I'd love to hear a little bit more about your observations here, because you said that a few years prior, you'd heard that students really voiced a preference for hybrid um, connections, and now they're they're really preferring the synchronous mode. Um, so if you can and speak I, to that, I'd love to hear. Your yeah, thoughts. so I think this occurred because they were really nervous about online, anything, anything that has to do with distance and being away from a professor. And the pandemic forced them, when nobody had a choice, right? We all had to go virtual. And because we didn't have a voice uh, of a choice, they it became natural for them, or or it became more familiar, not natural, more familiar to them. And in becoming more familiar, they're not afraid of it anymore. So they don't necessarily have to come to campus, but they do want to see somebody through a video chat. And I think that's where that synchronous experience takes place. So that they're happy, they want to be able to talk to someone, ask questions, intervene. Um, I can't tell you at first when we started having those like meet with the dean, meet with the service units, people would show up just to solve problems, right? They would solve problems. But now we're at the point where uh, we're seeing a lot less of those problems. And now we're hearing more about, okay, if we're, if we're going to do hybrid, can we do hybrid with live synchronous, not, these, not this asynchronous? So now they're asking for more live synchronous sessions, live um, synchronous study hours not, or office hours for faculty where they can drop in and chat with, with their professors. Um, that's what they want. They want these engaging experiences, not necessarily in person, but virtually in person. So we call that like that live synchronous experience. Right, and that's so interesting because it actually goes counter to what we hear in the media about all the Zoom fatigue and the number of Zoom meetings decreasing because no one wants to meet that way. So keeping that um, in mind that it might still be a powerful tool for our students is really important. So thank you. Yeah, and it depends on your context. Everything depends on context. That's why I, I, at the, my, one of my first slides was student population. Who are my people? My people are commuters, uh, multi-generational people, uh, families living under one roof. And we always have to keep that in mind. A lot of students didn't want to come back because they're afraid of um, catching COVID and giving it to an elderly parent or an elderly grandparent at home. Not so much for themselves. They're more afraid for their fragile relatives that live under the same roof. And those are things that we as administrators really have to really take that in, into account in, in our decision making and be flexible where we can. So any other questions? Thanks, Holly. 
if I'm allowed the last one. <laughs> <laughs> Go on ahead. Um, I was like this as a student as well, so thank you for <laughs> uh, and, and the last one is, I think this is more of a, um, a direct or, or just asking for your personal, you know, um, advice or just um, opinion, which is as someone who comes from a low income um, public institution, most of the times when we go to conferences and we hear people, we always look at, well, that's a private university. They have the funding, they have the resources, they have the, all of these different things. And we forget that there are some fundamental things that anybody could do, right, to still help students. And so my question to you is, out of all the different things that you've done, what could be the one, two, or three nuggets of things that you can say, hey, Mauricio, this is what my research or what I've done or what I believe actually works, regardless of the institution, if you are concerned about student success. So I, I'd say first thing is put students at the center of, of what you do. Um, when you're doing something, have them in mind. Um, don't think for them, in, include them in your, in your decision making, in your conversations, when you're building programming, you know, have them pilot. Um, something that you're what you want to roll out, bring them into the um, it, have them at the table with you um, to the collaboration. Um, we we are private, but we have a shoestring budget because we're tuition dependent. And so we're very small. And so um, a little loss in, in enrollment for us is huge. Um, and we haven't good. Thank goodness in Miami, we've been steady and our retention has increased. Um, but that has to do with the efforts, cross-functional cross efforts, cross-discipline efforts of faculty, my department, collaborating to, to, for those hard cases, you know, collaborating with those students. So stay student-centered, you know, invite other people to the table when you're making decisions, when you're trying to solve problems, um, get, get those ideas out there. And um, for people who come from places like me that we have a shoestring budget, what do we have that we already have that's not being used? What do we already have that's not being harnessed you know, for impact among the students? And for me, that was Blackboard. Um, you know, We have it already, there's a space there, um, I'm gonna use it. And that was, and I made really great friends with my ed tech guy. And when I need something announced, guess what? Um, he's gonna announce it for me on Blackboard so that all students open that up. And the first thing they see is that announcement, you know, build those bridges, build the bridges, use what you got, keep it student centered. Thank you so much. Really appreciate it. Mauricio, connect with me, um, email me, you know, being part of a larger conversation, right, about student success, anyone, we can form, you know, these student success groups that really collaborate, and it, not with much time, you know, 30 minutes a month, an hour a month, where we can get together and talk about our issues, that's really going to move the needle forward for students. Absolutely. Um I mean, we're out of time. Maybe uh, do we have your contact information either on a slide or your LinkedIn? It's it's on the slide. It's on it's oh, on the slide. Um, and I'll type it into here. Uh, and I'm on also on LinkedIn. So I think we're almost out of time. I think we have two minutes. Am I correct? Yes. I'm about to send uh, the link for the evaluation. So for everyone that was, uh, they will not copy. Okay. Please fill out the evaluations. Very important for heads to know, um, you know, feedback. Guys, we rely so much on feedback with um, in everything that we do. You know, we need that feedback. And thank you all for coming. It's been a pleasure um, to have this conversation. And really, we want to just push student success as much as we can, however that looks, wherever you are. Um, and if you need anything, I'm here. If you need me to talk to your people or we want to have conversations, um, by all means, you know, just we have to depend on each other. Just in case, as a reminder that this is the session at 2 p.m. on February 3rd, just in case when you fill out the form to make sure that 
you, you click on the right, you're evaluating the right panel. And remind me, is it retention, access, distance learning, or special session? Retention. Retention, okay. Okay, I'm gonna stop recording over here. Thank you so much, doctor. Uh, Thank you, everyone. A very, a very good presentation. I learned as a student, and I think if everyone enjoyed it as much as I did, it was a pretty good presentation. Thank you so much. Thanks everyone for coming out. Thank you so much.